Ian, what, what's your role in the band <laughs> musically? What exactly would you say you do here, Ian? <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, um, I like to think of keys as an instrument of variety. Uh, everything else on this stage is, uh, with the exception of probably drums, um, is a pretty one-faceted instrument. An acoustic sounds like an acoustic. Uh, a guitar, even an electric guitar, you can do a little bit, but you're still in two amps, um, and it's going to have a sound and a frequency spectrum, and you're not going to get away from that. Uh, in keyboard land, you can do almost anything. You know, and you can, you can pull in chimes, and you can pull in uh, gritty piano, and low end, and sub bass, and synths, and reverbed out things, and there's so much stuff you can do that I think keyboard should be the place where you can be a little surprising. Uh, and so I look at it like a variety, but then also movement. Like, um, the, the kind of dynamic you can do with a keyboard is very similar to what you can do with drums. It's actually interesting. That's why I, it, this really is revelatory for me. I'm listening to Josh talk over here and listening to him. Like, this is actually very similar to what, you know, the concepts in that you can, you can really manipulate the frequency spectrum with motion. And a lot of people hate the idea of playing pad, period. Um, but I do a little different. Like, um... First and foremost, I don't have a, what you would call a warm pad sound on here. There, there isn't one. Um, and I'm pretty sure you've heard me play one. So, you know, you might be wondering how that happens. And every single sound I have um, is bright at some point, or just about. And it, that's my main pad sound. But what's kind of cool is uh, you can kind of assign an effect to it called filter, and you're able to filter sweep it down. You're kind of getting to that warm pad range now. Add reverb if you want. And using Ableton's grain delay, um, you can do this kind of thing. get the idea right so it's um, <laughs> the ability to take something and add movement to it um, I like that a lot the ability to morph sounds quickly uh, you can do it with piano too um, you know you can play something like that and add a reverb Are we distorting or is that just my ears? Can't tell if it's distorting. My ears are distorting right now, but it shouldn't be. the right kind of patch you could go from that very quickly and turn a couple knobs and all of a sudden you're into like it's hitting the compressor a little hard in my I can't think that compressor we have on in my mix is hitting hard I can hear <laughs> it from the house cool yeah um <laughs> Anyway, so you can kind of get the idea the amount of dynamic you can get out of one patch is very different than just I'm playing a piano uh, if I were to come over, Daniel, can you turn the mics on this piano real quick? And actually, this is kind of cool. This piano is a MIDI controller as well. So when I was sitting at it yesterday, I actually wasn't playing it. Um, <laughs> let's see if this works real quick. Is that on out there at all? So with a piano, um, you know, 
there's, there's a level of dynamic you can even get out of a real piano without all of these effects and stuff like that. And I think that there's a real key. It's kind of like Jeffrey was saying, different players play differently, and Josh is talking about consistency. Like, if I were to play just really subtle kind of chords, um, versus even just a little bit different. Like this would be if you're nervous or your hands are really cold, uh, potentially you're going. And it comes out a little different. The emotion is very different. And so the ability to lay into a sound and, you know, and then very quickly go from. changes the emotion a lot, right? You're able to convey a lot of different stuff. And I think that that's really key uh, for keyboarders to consider anyway. And as far as tracks go, like, and we get into the frequency spectrum, the way Brandon and I have handled it uh, as far as bass goes is when we're rehearsing um, for albums or on rehearsal land, like, if sub bass is in there, it's because he and I have agreed upon a bass progression. Uh, and it's usually like a pattern of some kind. So you'll hear slash notes hit and stuff like that. So, you know, 6415, 6435 uh, might be an eight bar pattern or we might even have uh, you know something different at the very very end that we're that's changing a little bit uh, and that's kind of an agreed upon thing and outside of that I typically stay out of his world I like to give Brandon that even to the degree of you'll notice uh, a lot at the ends of songs when we're just floating around I won't be playing the left hand at all I'll let Brandon do that he's really good at rolling out the highs uh, and he, I don't know if he's do are you doing I don't know if he's doing that with EQ or if he's just playing really quietly but both both. Yeah. Um, so he'll roll out the highs and just almost act as a little sub bass or a little synth. Um, and it means that he can, who's really good at understanding that bass spectrum and, and knowing what different notes do, um, he's able to kind of handle that. That's um, great. I, I noticed on, um, I can't remember what song it was, but there's some part, again, it's like everyone's going big and then you're just playing this like simple little lead line, but it added, you know, it adds so much, it like cuts through and it, it's like you're kind of stepping out of the way again to make space for everyone else to kind of hold that foundation note. Yeah, totally. It's, and that's the interesting thing about keyboard. Like, you'll hear it a lot in our music because it's, uh, it's sometimes just the way the production process goes. We define really heavily uh, rhythm, first and foremost. Like, because uh, if you think about a live recording, um, you know, the one thing that can't be changed later is the drums. Uh, it starts messing really heavily with crowd and all of this stuff like the drums have to be right and because of that For a live recording we hone in on that and so the first thing we, we work through is the rhythm section and then uh, in the arrangement and then we find hooks for songs next uh, and that typically lands in guitar or a little piano thing and then uh, I'll, I'll do a bunch of work before but a lot of the work is after the fact I'll start sequencing and layering in at the end and so my role really does become to fill out like hey you know like there's been times we've gotten songs back and I listen to the intro and burst out laughing like, what were we thinking? This is horrible. And then it's my job to go through and start filling, right? And I'm going through and filling this and filling that and finding, you know, rhythm or frequency or whatever. And, and that's something that, uh, that Josh and I have talked about that um, is it's not, you know, he'll keep the intervals going too. And that it's kind of between the two of us, different intervals are almost always happening. And if they're not, it's very purposeful that they're not. Right, so it's... it's uh, it's interesting. It's a very much a production thing. When you're going to add, like you're at the very end, end and they hand it to you and you're going to add stuff, are you thinking, I want to add something that contrasts this? So if it's warm, I want to be bright. If it's rhythmic, I want to be ambient. Um, do you have something in your mind where you hear a sound and go, I'm going to do the opposite? Or is it just trial and error till it feels right? Yeah, it, it depends. I mean, we have a process. There's definitely every song gets sub bass, uh, like, like not, not synth bass, uh, but su like just a sine wave sub bass that follows exactly what Brandon's playing, um, which sometimes is easy and sometimes is a royal pain. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, and it's, you're, you're following exactly what the bass is doing. Uh, usually get some kind of pad to fill out any space it needs uh, and we'll cut it out where it's not necessary. 
And then I go through, uh, I'll layer different sounds to make them pop right. Like, and first off, these patches I'm playing are available on multi-tracks. Uh, these are ones that I, uh, I, I put out for Reason and Main Stage. And I'm trying to get contact versions soon-ish. We'll see. In Ableton shortly after, I hope. The way I'll go, you'll find if you get on there and look at the way the songs are tagged, there's like 15 sounds for a song or 20 sounds for a song, but some of those are all layered in one, you know, one particular line. And so it's like a piano and a chime and a thing and another thing all layered doing the same thing. Uh, and I just kind of fill the space that's needed. So sometimes it's, you know, it's instinctive, like you're, you're listening and you're hearing the guitar and you're hearing this and it's like, it's just not right. Um, and hopefully you have a good instinct and you're like, okay, you know, I know I want to try this. I know I want to try that. Uh, and if not, then you go to the bag of tricks, right? Where, and that's where it's the like, okay, let's try something rhythmic. Okay, let's try something. There's nothing in the high end. You can definitely analyze and, and come up with something, but a lot of the time it really depends on the song and what your instinct is. Uh, I'm sure if I analyzed more, it would be what you're talking about, a lot of opposites and contrasts. Uh, Fierce is a, is a great example in some ways of doing that where the keys start filling out a lot of the rhythm in the tracks. Uh, start filling out a lot of the intervals in the building um, and it makes it a very unique tune uh, in how it builds. It's not the classic sort of uh, worship tune as far as building goes. It builds in a really unique way and manipulates the frequency spectrum and the rhythm and stuff like that. <laughs> 